I normally wouldn't do this, but many of you insisted on checking out a lot of supposed worthy movies I missed from 2007. So instead of moving to the previous year, I gathered 10 movies which I didn't mention in 2007, and I will retroactively include. Disregard the previous ranking, as the new one will be the one you see in the description. Going by order from worst to best, these are my impressions. The worst of the bunch was Alving and the Chipmunks. Just like pretty much any 2D cartoon that turns into CGI and includes live-action segments, it was a constant uncanny valley effect for anyone who grew up with the original. It's also not helpful when you try to deal with real-world issues pop idols are facing, and you spend a lot of time in trying to make it seem plausible, only to resolve everything in a childish way. Second worst was the B movie. You know you are artistically bankrupt when you center most of the movie on puns regarding bees. There were actually a few successful jokes, and what did you know? It was always about combining two different things, neither of which had anything to do with bees. Also, despite the movie not having a villain, the one causing every single problem was the protagonist, who was also the one solving them. So why was everybody praising the asshole who caused all this fuss in the first place? Third worst was Juno. Although The Last Jedi made the subversion for the sake of subversion a thing to laugh about, a decade ago, and to a much smaller degree, the exact thing was happening with anything that was involving movies and video games with Ellen Page. It was all about subverting expectations than having actually well-made stories. In this year, for example, it was all about presenting teen pregnancy as if it's an okay thing and everybody's fine about it. Whoever watched the movie completely unsuspected was baffled with the concept and began yelling Mach subversions everywhere. Obviously, this wouldn't last, since a few years later nobody seemed to love this movie anymore because it was normalizing teen pregnancy. Fast forward a few years and now every single queer wants to normalize every single deviance in existence. Do you not understand why liberals are a pile of cringe? Fourth worst was a shoot 'em up. I can imagine the director thinking like a hormone-filled 14-year-old who was thinking of a hundred silly ways to kill someone with guns or carrots. As fun as the ridiculous massacres are in terms of violence and gross humor, there is no depth in here. This is not John Wick or The Raid, which was giving you legit reasons to care for the characters instead of just looking at the absurd violence. You don't care about anyone in this movie, and that's why it's a throwaway action flick. And now we enter the dreaded drama territory, which I normally always stay away from since it's not working for me. For someone who watched Stalker in the first Star Trek movie in his teens, such movies always feel very long, very slow, and don't have enough things going on to keep me interested. Zodiac was a very long movie about trying to find a serial killer. Although it was occasionally interesting by showing how the public and the media were reacting to these murders, it was just jumping from one thing to another. It was full of red herrings, fake suspense, and the ending was completely anticlimactic. The assassination of Jesse James was similar in showing how outlaws were living during the Wild West and how the society was reacting to them. It was again ridiculously long, it was constantly jumping from one thing to another, and there was never any sense of urgency or tension. It actually became interesting when the thing in the title happened, but it was like the last 20 minutes. Why couldn't they simply make a movie based on those 20 minutes? It would be infinitely better than what we got. There Will Be Blood is again similar in showing how oil tycoons were doing their business during the previous century, and how their actions were affecting the society around them. Again, it was jumping from one thing to another, you could hardly feel the continuity, it was mostly boring, and the ending was completely disappointing. It was mostly the great performances and the cinematography that were worth it, not the actual story. Into the Wild had a non-linear plot, which is always a plus when your story doesn't have enough meat for an over two-hour film. It was gradually showing how the protagonist was thinking through his interactions with people he met on his way. In an almost ironic way, his objective ended up backfiring since it was never about living the fullest by being alone in the wilderness, which is what the name of the movie implies. It was always about the journey and the way he forms relationships with others. So when the movie constantly moves back to the present when he manages to be alone in the wilderness, it's like you're told he left behind everything that was actually making him happy. It's very eye-opening in a way, even if he never realized it before it was too late. The best of these dramas was The Bucket List. 
Two dying men form a bromance and try to experience everything they didn't in their whole lives before they kick the bucket. Now that's how you do drama. Not over two hours, normally paced and funny half the time. It's like a trip around the world where they are celebrating life. Instead of trying to find life by running away from relationships like Into the Wild, it was moving, it was meaningful, and the ending was satisfying for once. And the best movie of the bunch was The Time Crimes, which had to do with time travel. And I know how you will think there is something wrong with me because I hate the concept, but this is an exception, because I have to spoil the main trick. It's a time loop. It's not about trying to fix the past, it's about doing what you were always supposed to be doing. It's presented in a way that makes it linear and not linear at the same time. And it has tension, urgency and a satisfying ending. And that's how you make a good movie.